All right, John McElroy here talking all things automotive. Today, I'm talking with Nick Icavella. He's from the Coalition for a Prosperous America, where he serves as the Senior Vice President of Public Affairs and Communications. Nick, I, I really welcome this opportunity to talk to you because the coalition's really been tracking all this investment that Mexico are, is getting from Chinese automotive suppliers and automakers. What can you tell us? Yeah, what we've seen uh, is ever since the USMCA was enacted, you know, not surprisingly, China is incredibly uh, creative and intelligent about getting around, uh, you know, our different trade remedies, whether it's tariffs, ADCVD duties. And so what we've seen, especially in the automotive sector, but it's happening across other sectors as well, is that. Uh, China has recognized that there's an increased uh, attention on trade policy from the U.S. government. Um, you know, ever since uh, President Trump was elected, he's enacted tariffs on Chinese products. And we've seen the Biden administration and President Biden actually continue those policies. And we've seen China move from, you know, mainland Chinese factories to factories in Southeast Asia. And what we've seen in the last couple of years is really an influx of investment into Mexico. And uh, they are trying to take advantage of the ability for access to the U.S. market through USMCA. Uh, we've talked to a number of companies that are actually based in Mexico. Um, they're not U.S. companies. And, and they're very worried about what's going on, uh, this investment coming in from Chinese companies not just to, to send product to the U.S. market, but what it means for, for Mexican companies, Mexican workers. And I saw a stat the other day that we're trying to confirm to see if it's true, but uh, it was over 80% of uh, added domestic capacity in Mexico is actually from Chinese entities. Um, so it's, you know, obviously if that's the case, e even if it's half of that, that would be alarming. But uh, if that's truly the case, 80%, it would represent a massive increase uh, of activity from China really to enter into the U.S. market. Yeah, in fact, your coalition has identified, uh, just looking at automotive suppliers from China alone, a, a very significant number and investment on their part. It, it has. Uh, in the EV sector, just in automotive in general, um, we saw China's number one EV maker, uh, go to Mexico. Um, you're, you're talking think, about BYD there, right? It, exactly. Uh, a report that we put out over the summer, you know, so this data could be slightly dated. It's probably increased. But um, since June 2022, we've seen uh, nearly 30 Chinese auto part manufacturers uh, and car makers actually move in to Mexico um, with a over seven billion dollars of investment uh, into added capacity, and the automotive sector, I think, is is really a key sector to look at in terms of China's foreign direct investment into Mexico, because of the parameters that were put in the automotive sector in the USMCA deal. Those added uh, North American contents uh, uh, thresholds, and so for for China, you know. China's, uh, China's goal in all of these industries is, is not profitability. And I think that's really lost in some of the discussion. China's goal in every sector that it seeks to dominate uh, is global market share. And they do that through a number of, of economic, I'll call them predatory economic uh, strategies. The first is to overproduce. Um, drive the price down, you know, artificially as much as they can, overproduce through subsidized companies. Uh, and then when, once they have that overcapacity, dump it into the global market. Because China is not producing to meet its own internal domestic demand. It produces well beyond that. And the in the automotive sector, you know, whether you're talking about cars, you know, actual vehicles, or uh, the automotive aftermarket industry, which is you know massive, we're talking tens of billions of dollars. Uh, China recognizes that it can it can drive some economic growth, you know, in its own country by overproducing in those sectors. And what that means when it overproduces is it's harming a foreign competitor, whether it's in Mexico, 
a U.S. competitor, you know, a multinational that produces maybe, you know, in, in the U.S. or in other countries. And, and that's really the risk. And so that's something that we've really taken a look at, you know, just in the last couple of years, because this is an important sector, whether you're talking about uh, actual vehicles or, or aftermarket parts, you know, these are good jobs, good paying jobs. There's no reason why we should cede those to China just because uh, this predatory activity, you know, we should say, great, we'll just let them do it. You know, so um, that's what we've been working on. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, some of your research seems to suggest that this isn't just individual companies coming on their own. They seem to be coming over as groups. Uh, you identified this one Lingong machinery company that's uh, going to build road equipment, excavators and the like in Mexico, but is actually leasing out factory space to automotive suppliers. And then there's this Hofusan Industrial Park, which is actually a Chinese industrial park in Mexico just for Chinese companies. And uh, that that would suggest that this is uh, uh, some sort of plan on a group basis or, you know, Chinese group basis, not just individual companies deciding to locate in Mexico. No, I, I absolutely. Uh, one of the things, uh, you make an excellent point, which I think is lost when people talk about how China captures market share. They, they don't do it, you know, we have large companies in the US, right? Apple, you know, they make iPhones. China doesn't look at Apple and say, okay, Apple's a great, you know, company that makes iPhones and we should help them. China looks at the sector and says, we have 10 or 12 different apples. And how can we as the Chinese government support the entire sector so that we move in and we capture the full scale supply chain in that industry. And that's exactly what they do through massive government subsidies. Um, you know, I know we're talking about automotive, but solar is another great example of how China has dominated, you know, an industry where really the US used to be a major player. But in, in the automotive space, if you think about how many different pieces of the supply chain there are, you know, if you're talking about a vehicle, the parts that go into it to the finished product china doesn't just want to dominate you know the the final vehicle you know a byd right uh, the four-door sedan a car they want to dominate the entire supply chain and so that's how they do it when they move in production it's it's not a finished product that they're looking to you know to compete with and and that's what we're seeing in mexico these billions of dollars of investment into mexico across the entire supply chain to not just displace the final product, but all the key inputs from start to finish. And that's what they've done in other sectors. It's a very strategic way of not just uh, displacing the competition throughout the supply chain, but also affecting the finished product and the market share that they're ultimately trying to capture. Yeah. Th that being said, uh, the coalition has also said many of those suppliers were invited to Mexico by Tesla and by the Ford Motor Company. Yeah, I think, you know, through China's Belt and Road Initiative, we've seen uh, countries invite investment from China. Um, Mexico was no different. You know, I think initially the Chinese promise of increased investment in factory and, and production in, the, in their country, you know, it, it sounds inviting, um, especially when China is paying, you know, <laughs> to, to build the facility. They're not looking for uh, tax credits, you know, or help from the government. They already have assistance from the Chinese government. But every single one of those countries where China has come in and made investment, they're figuring out that it sounds too good to be true, you know, because it is. Um, and when we talk to companies that, you know, are actual, you know, Mexican owned companies in this industry, they're incredibly worried about what's going on. You know, you have a market in Mexico to make these products and, you know, because of USMCA, they have access to the U.S. market. What we've seen is Chinese investment coming in and actually undercutting the Mexican producers. And again, this is because China's, uh, you know, their their singular goal is is market share. Right. And not just in the in the country where they're making investment, but global market share. And. That is a serious problem if you're a Mexican producer because you may not be able to compete. Uh, you may have to lay off some workers. You may have to lower your price just to compete with the Chinese product. 
And then once you lower the price, the Chinese will lower the price again. In a lot of cases, when China makes these investments in added capacity, they're not hiring Mexican workers, you know, or American workers. They're bringing workers from China. Um, when they build the factories, they're bringing workers from China to build the factory. You know, so when you actually dig into the details, the Chinese investment, it's more like a beachhead where we just want the space that you're giving us in the country to set up our own shop using our own resources, our own workers. And then once we've created that facility, we're going to use it to directly undermine any competitors that may exist in the home country and elsewhere. And, and so that's what we're seeing with, with this uh, FDI flows into Mexico from China. Um, I mean, again, you know, an $8 billion, almost $8 billion investment in Mexico is a, in U.S. dollars is an incredibly massive sum of money. And, and so, you know, it's, it's no secret that if you talk to a Mexican producer in any of these sectors, they'll share these concerns with you. And I do think that uh, those concerns are being heard across, you know, the U.S., the United States, and Canada. Uh, next year, USMCA is up for sort of its midterm review, um, and it's it's actually in 2026. But they'll start looking at this next year in 2025. And and one thing that I know will be a topic that uh, lawmakers want to address is this uh, exploitation of USMCA by China. We've actually talked to lawmakers who said, you know, we really should start calling it the US-Mexico, you know, Canada-China trade agreement. Um, and how can we get China out of USMCA? And so, you know, that's something that we're working on. It's definitely an area that we want to see addressed. Well, what are what's some of the advice that you're giving to uh, lawmakers to to prevent Chinese automakers from taking advantage of the USMCA? So you could actually carve out specific rules within USMCA where you you can if it's a Chinese company, and of course you have to be very specific about defining what a Chinese company is because they're they're very creative about you know creating subsidiaries and a whole umbrella network you know. Um, I, I talk to reporters all the time, you know, about tariffs, you know, and, and they say, well, you know, the, the tariff is paid by an American company, you know, and it ultimately is paid by the U.S. consumer. And that's, first of all, that's just not the case. You know, the, the government actually studied every single sector that we've had China tariffs imposed on, and they found that there's been negligible consumer price increases in every single sector that they studied the tariffs boosted domestic production, which, you know, that's that's what tariffs are used for to increase domestic production. So this whole notion that there's consumer price increases, you know, it's just not the case. The data doesn't show that. But I think the most important point is that when you're, you're talking about how can we carve out China from USMCA, there needs to be a better sense of excluding products that are made by a Chinese company, no matter if it's from the mainland or a subsidiary in the home country. You know, if, if you look at uh, who pays the tariff on a BYD import, yes, it's it's a BYD subsidiary that's a US entity, but that's a Chinese company, right? Um, there may be a Mexican subsidiary of a Chinese company that is a Mexican entity, but again, it's, it's wholly owned by the Chinese government. And so that's something that needs to be accounted for when the USMCA is revised. Uh, or renegotiated is to exclude Chinese products, um, whether it's made, you know, in China and the mainland and, and sent to Mexico and shipped through, if it's uh, assembled in Mexico, if some significant part of it is manufactured in Mexico, we shouldn't allow China to exploit this trade agreement that's meant to benefit workers in North America. Mm -hmm. um, what do you make of this uh, Commerce Department push? at least when it comes to finished cars, of blocking fully assembled Chinese cars, connected cars, from coming into the United States because presumably they could collect information that would be sent back to China. I, what, do you think that has any traction or what's your thoughts on that? I, I do. Uh, we actually, we, we worked with Senator Brown on this. Um, he's been one of the leaders, I think, uh, in calling out you know, the risks to, to the U.S. automotive sector from China. 
um, whether it's EVs, whether it's, you know, normal combustible engines. And I think it, it was either last month or the month before, uh, but he released a, a bill that would basically make it impossible for a Chinese connected car to operate into the U.S. And if you talk to folks in the intelligence community, um, they will tell you that if there is a device that's connected to a network, <laughs> then it has the ability to be, you know, used for spying and intelligence gathering, um, period. And a Chinese connected car, you know, certainly fits that, that definition. Uh, these cars can collect, as you mentioned, vast amounts of data. Um, we shouldn't be letting them near our military bases, but we shouldn't be letting them into our country to begin with, I think. And it's not just that they're a national security threat. The U.S. automotive industry, uh, in particular, the EV sector, is trying to get off the ground. There's massive government, uh, you know, incentives to produce these cars here for consumers to buy them. Uh, I understand, you know, the, the the push from, you know, especially Democrats um, to to want to move into more EVs, you know, as part of their push to address climate change. I look at that sector as if the demand is going to grow, and there's American companies that can produce these vehicles we should want them to be able to compete on a level playing field to create jobs and have this this production in in the us and at least in north america if possible what we've seen is is china recognizes that you know it's not that evs are are skyrocketing in demand because everybody likes to drive an electric car i you know that's not the case when you have the incentive to purchase an ev you know you're changing consumer behavior and China sees that there's a, a government push to move people into EVs. And so they see this again as a sector where they could dominate globally and capture market share and do so with through predatory economic activity, overproduction, uh, you know, drastically driving down the price and dumping that product into markets where there's competition. And so we should protect against that. You know, we, we shouldn't allow First of all, the taxpayer money that's being invested to incentivize these EVs here, we shouldn't just, you know, essentially light that money on fire by ceding control to the Chinese. That that's not being a good uh, steward of taxpayer dollars, and it's also not what the policies are designed, you know, to uh, to create. You know, the incentives are designed to create domestic production and have people purchase EVs. We should want those to be U.S. made or, you know, USMCA North American made if possible. Uh, the U.S. government is reportedly putting pressure on Mexico to not provide any sort of incentives or anything like that, tax breaks for Chinese companies locating there. Uh, do you see that as, a, as an effective way or what's happening on that front? Well, I think Mexico really has gotten itself in a precarious position by inviting so much investment from China uh, into its country. Once the Chinese have uh, sort of, you know, a, a large uh, productive capacity that they've created in the country, it's it's hard to, as a, as a lawmaker in that country, take any steps, you know, to get rid of it or to make it so that they have to compete fairly. Um, you know, because there there is economic activity around that investment. So I think Mexico is really going to have to be very careful uh, how they protect their own companies and workers from this massive influx of Chinese investment. And it's something that needs to be done in the context of, of what USMCA was supposed to, uh, you know, be negotiated for, especially in the automotive sector. Uh, I think one of the, the best uh, provisions of USMCA was to actually create uh, a better, uh, more uh, full supply chain in the automotive sector in North America, um, you know, with the content standards. And what Mexico is doing is really undermining that goal. And so it, when USMCA is renegotiated, you know, it needs to be done with that goal in mind and also with uh, provisions to prevent China from undermining that goal with the activities it's already done. But I think Mexico is in a very tough position now that they've invited that much investment from China. 
Um, final question here then. Uh, as you know, automakers are under enormous cost pressures. Uh, cost of making cars continues to go up. Uh, their margins are getting squeezed. Consumers are complaining about high, high car prices. These automakers are very tempted to, to source from these Chinese suppliers in Mexico because they're offering up to one third lower cost than anything they can buy in the rest of the world. What would your advice be to these car companies that are considering sourcing components from Chinese companies in Mexico? Well, I, I mean, I talk to a lot of CEOs and, and, you know, executives at companies and manufacturing companies each week, you know, daily. And I understand that at the end of the day, you know, I'm sitting here talking as a person that works for a policy organization and we're thinking about the big picture um, industry level. But, you know, those executives, they have workers that they employ um, who have families and they have to make tough decisions that affect their bottom line. And, you know, that's, I think, what's unfortunate about some of these policies is that we really need to move much more quickly on them uh, and, and have the impact felt quicker if we're going to try to reverse some of these trends. Uh, I mean, my warning always has been if you partner with a Chinese company, you just have to know that uh, their ultimate goal is to put you out of business. <laughs> they, they may be you know, content to do business with you right now and make product for you. Um, but they're trying to figure out a way to displace you in the market. If you're making a profit because you have market share, they want to figure out how to capture your market share so that you have to do things like lower the price, um, you know, eat into your profits uh, to eventually when you no longer can compete in that market. And, you know, this isn't hyperbole or, you know, this isn't me, you know, fantasizing about what they could do. If you look at any sector that China is involved in, they have the exact same playbook that they use. It's incredibly effective, unfortunately. <laughs> and we're seeing only now recently in the last decade and really in the last few years, uh, lawmakers realizing that this is something that they can address through policy, but the policies have to work together. So you, it, this is not going to be solved with tariffs alone or quotas. It's not going to be solved with industrial policy alone. All of these things have to work together. And that's, that's what we work on in industry specific at CPA is try to create uh, the situation where our industrial policy and our, our trade policy is working in order to prevent China from using those predatory economic activities to undermine the domestic producers, but also give the domestic producer assurances that there is a market that they can compete in, incentives to uh, make investments in long-term productive capacity to, to increase their ability to make products in the US, and that those are gonna be in place so that those investments can bear fruit, right? So that, you know, three, five, 10 years down the road, those investments are actually, you know, good investments and in the, in the consumer market is still there. Um, that can only be done if there's those policy, if, if there's a situation where those policies are working together. So for those who haven't heard of the Coalition for a Prosperous America, what is the coalition? Who provides your funding? Yeah, so so we we started in 2007, mainly because uh, there were uh, about a dozen companies that produce, you know, right here in the United States, their domestic manufacturers. They were members of the National Association of Manufacturers, or NAM, um, which you know I think people probably have heard of. It's an incredibly large group, hundreds of millions of dollars in budget every year. And, and the, those companies were upset because NAM was actually advocating for policies that uh, were, would harm domestic companies that were producing in the US. And so they split off from NAM and they started CPA. Uh, CPA has, I think, a, a great niche. We only represent domestic manufacturers, you know, exclusively. So uh, if, if you have any sort of productive capacity in the U.S., you could be a member of us. If you have zero domestic capacity in the United States, you could not be a member of, of our trade association. Uh, I think it was funny the other day, some a reporter told me, you know, this is just a special interest group for companies that like tariffs. And 
And I said, well, you know, we represent domestic manufacturers. And if, if that's a special interest, then, you know, yes, I do have a special interest in companies that want to actually invest in the United States and create jobs here, you know, create good American jobs. So if that's the definition of special interest, then, you know, I'm, I'm as special as it gets. <laughs> uh, but that's what we do. And, you know, we've been around, uh, you know, since, since then for almost two decades, um, and we, we work pretty much exclusively on tax and trade issues because those are the ones that really are impacting uh, domestic manufacturers the most. And not surprisingly, uh, the China issues are woven into basically everything that, that we advocate for. Um, you know, if there's one country in the world that has impacted U.S. domestic manufacturers the most, it's certainly China. Nick, I really appreciate your time today. Uh... I really like uh, all the investigative work that the, the coalition has done. I have found it uh, to be a, a really good source. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you for, for reading it. And I'm glad it's making an impact. You know, there's, there's a lot of sectors like the automotive sector, the aftermarket parts that when you look at them, th these are great jobs. They're growing. You know, these industries aren't going away anytime soon. And we should not, you know, as, as policymakers, just be willing to seed those jobs away simply because, you know, China is doing something underhanded. Uh, and so I hope that's a message that people take away is that, you know, there, there is an entity like CPA out there advocating for these companies and these workers. And, you know, like I mentioned, I understand that CEOs and they have to make tough decisions every day about the bottom line. But, you know, we're trying to operate at the 30,000 foot level to to create policies that are in place to allow these companies to not just be you know, successful now, but to expand and create more jobs in this country, hopefully, you know, five, 10 years from now.